Thank you for coming. Good evening. My name is Lori Anzini. I'm the chair of the Democratic Party of El Dorado County. And I thank all of the candidates who have shown up tonight. We really appreciate you being, participating in our candidate forum. Your activity here will help uh, others throughout the county make a decision on, July, on June 5th. It takes a lot of coordination and volunteerism to do this kind of event. And with that, I want to thank all the super volunteers who have made this possible. I'd like to ask all the DCC members to please stand and be acknowledged. <laughs> to acknowledge is our two chairs of the Candidate Development Committee, but she's not here, Kathleen's not here tonight, but Rich, I'd like to have Rich Boylan stand because he's certainly been the mentor of the Candidate Development <laughs> And also want to acknowledge Frank Porter, who is our chair of our Campaign Services Committee. men have a lot of experience working in campaigns and having them work with us this particular year has been very fruitful for all of us. Our visibility is stronger and we have a lot of volunteers who are coming in and helping us. I'd like to identify a couple of VIPs. Um, let's see, Heidi Weiland and Carl Weiland. Carl, uh, Carl is assessor, right? Board of Education. So thank you very much for both of you. Have I missed any other VIP members here? Okay. Most, some of the candidates that are, you're going to hear from are also incumbents, so they will be given a certain amount of time to explain themselves. So our candidate uh, development and candidate services committees have been working so hard for 18 months to give our fellow Democrats and others an opportunity to seek elected offices, and prepare them and educate them about the principles of being an elected official. This is also an opportunity for our voters to meet the candidates and match the names that they will see on their ballots to the people who are seeking our approval for running our county. The positions they are running for are positions that manage our taxes, revenues, and our resources. We are entrusting our faith and votes to people who we would feel would do this well without compromise or unethical behavior. If anyone has been watching the news for the last 18 months, one should realize how important it is to vote. And I want to add, four years ago, the shame of our county turnout for the midterms was well over 50% of the people in our county did not vote. So, people are a little bit of awake about that one and we want to make sure everybody participates. I'm sure there's going to be a significant turnout, not only in the primary this year, but in the general elections. Granted, these positions that these people are running for are nonpartisan positions, and their party designation should have no merit on their ability to run for these offices. This is your chance to review their ability to do that if they are elected on June 5th. I would like to introduce Dr. Joshua Elder, who is a member of our Democratic Central Committee. Josh is chair of our Resolutions and Positions Committee, and he will be the moderator for tonight's forum. Please welcome Josh. Testing sounds good, all right. Thanks for everyone being here tonight. A lot of active and engaged citizens. Love it. As a dad and as a doctor, I care about our community, and I want to see um, all the great I love, potential elected officials and what they have to say. Um, I'd like to have all of the potential elected officials come up, and then I'll introduce each of them. Um, so if you could work your way up on stage, that'd be great. So, everyone. 
everyone should potentially be in this order, but if not, you could just wave. Um, and the order for tonight will allow for each of uh, the members to come up and to have an introduction for two minutes. We have a timer, Daniela, who's a great high school student who came out to support us tonight. Um, so she'll be uh, putting up a yellow sign uh, for when one minute is left, and then a red sign when your time is done. After that, you'll have two minutes to essentially uh, uh, get two questions. So you'll have a question, and you'll have two minutes for response, and the timer again will let you know when that time is up. So to the left of me is uh, Trish Keller. She's the Deputy District Attorney and candidate for District Attorney. Next, Joe Harn, the incumbent candidate uh, for the Auditor Controller. Next is Michael Owen, candidate for Auditor Controller. Next is Dan Dellinger for recor Recorder Clerk. This is Janelle Horn for Recorder Clerk. Next is Todd White for Recorder Clerk. For Treasurer Tax Collector, we have Ann Billingsley. And Karen Coleman uh, was not able to attend tonight due to a family emergency. Uh, next up for Board of Supervisors, District 4, we have three candidates. Bo Ambrosowitz. <laughs> to the left of him, Lori Parley. <laughs> and Michael Ranelli as the incumbent candidate for Board of Supervisors, District 4. Great list of candidates to, tonight. Um, you could all make your way back to your seats. Um, and if we can hold on to, we can hold on to uh, our first Trish Keller. <laughs> safe within the community. 
And moreover, that we are working collaboratively with all of our justice partners to ensure that in a time when the criminal justice system is really changing substantially, when things are happening, the state is shifting its responsibilities to the counties. We have more people who are on the streets and not being incarcerated. We have to make sure that they are getting the supervision and the programs that they need to stay on the right track and make sure they are not reoffending within our communities. We need to work together with our criminal justice partners to ensure that happens. We need to be giving more attention to certain crimes in this community. We have substantial domestic violence in this community as well as elder abuse. We have a lot of identity theft. We are a rural community. Our mailboxes are out there very vulnerable to theft. We are one of the highest theft areas in the state for mail theft. That means people can steal our place. identity. We have a lot of work to do. Our DA's office, under my leadership, will be working for the public, not for the DA. I've got to be a careful steward of tax dollars. We should not be wasting money by having people from Placerville driving up and down the hill to uh, Tahoe because we have decimated the staff in Tahoe. We need to staff that office with people who live there and make the people that uh, have, make sure the people in Tahoe get the services that they deserve, as well as the people in the, on the West Slope. Treasure, there. that was wonderful. I love the presentation. Our time is up, unfortunately. So we're going to go to the audience now to have, and you can obviously uh, bring some of that information in as we answer some questions. Just trying to be respectful to everyone's time so we can get through everyone's time. So for the first question, we can get someone to essentially ask. And move over here. Let's see if. Uh... Questions for Trish. Mike Saunders is going to come over and hand you a mic, so you'll be able to. <laughs> You had mentioned that you talked about um, the different climate now with public resources and government realigning so much more when you have homelessness and domestic violence and a lack of resources in the county. How do you balance compassion for people that deserve it with justice for people that deserve it? Well, I think we do that in our job as looking at every case that comes to our office as a unique case and considering all of the factors around that. We don't just have a case come in and say, rubber stamp, you know, we're going to just file this, we're going to reject this. We have to consider all of the factors, and we do work actually with the defense bar, with the courts. We have specialty courts in this county um, for veterans court, behavioral health court, uh, DUI court, where we give people who have issues that need addressing beyond the fact that they have violated the law, that we're looking for the underlying you know, systematic problems so that we can address it. So I think we can have compassionate justice. I think that they are not mutually exclusive, and we are actually doing that. And I applaud, for example, the sheriff with his hot team. Um, we have wonderful sheriff's deputies out there working with the homeless to help them to get out off the street, to get you know on their feet and do whatever they have to do. It's an awesome program. They're doing a great job. So we can do this. We are doing it, and we can do better and more. For another question, at the beginning of the question, if you could introduce yourself as well. That's a microphone? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Dawn Wolfson. I'm from Cameron Park. And um, my big issue actually is campaign finance reform, which may sound off topic, but you know, there's a big to do down the hill with, with the Stephen Clark shooting and um, the DA down there having taken like over $400,000 in um, police campaign money. And I'm just wondering what you think about um, a DA handling sort of an off officer related shooting type case in that situation and, and should they maybe pass it off to somebody else? <coughs> It is our job as the district attorney to evaluate those types of cases. And if there is anything about the case where we feel there is a conflict of interest, then it can be referred to the attorney general's office. In that particular case, I know the attorney general has, has stepped in. But uh, the reality is that we work closely with law enforcement, obviously. That's part of what we do. But at the same time, there are boundaries. We're not rubber stamps. And our duties and our ethical and moral duty as district attorney is to be the objective, fair person to make sure that we are evaluating things in the 
right manner. We deal with facts. We deal with evidence. And if the evidence is there, we go forward with charges. If it's not, we don't. And that is what we need to do. Um, so I don't think the fact that we work with law enforcement in and of itself means that we have a built-in conflict of interest. We prosecute, you know, members of law enforcement. I've personally prosecuted members of law enforcement. You know, if, if that's what has to be done, that's what has to be done. Thank you. So we could have a round of applause for Trish. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Horn. Uh, right away, I feel like I've been set up. Uh, <laughs> trial lawyers are always the best speakers. They're the best politicians on the stump. Because they're used to standing in front of a jury, uh, not knowing what's coming next. You know, they don't know how the for, they don't know how the witness is going to answer, but they've got to be ready on their toes. So again, I feel set up, and it's going to be hard to it's going to be hard to uh, follow Trish. Am I closer to your mouth, please? Closer to your mouth. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, like my opponent, I'm a certified public accountant, and also like my opponent, I graduated from El Dorado High School in Placerville few years ago. Uh, after that I went to Sac State and I got my degree in accounting and I've been a certified public accountant since 1982. Uh, I'm proud of the job I've done as county auditor controller. Uh, when I started at the county we had a significant, uh, we had significant debt on the books, we had a negative, we had about 22 million dollars in bonds outstanding. Uh, we had a negative cash balance, actually, when I closed the books for the first time. Uh, we're in a lot better shape today. We have no bonds or notes outstanding, and we ended last fiscal year with about $45, $45 million in cash in the general fund. But we've got some huge obligations. Uh, the, the biggest, we've got a huge problem with road maintenance. We also have a huge problem with pensions. Uh, I opposed the pension increases in 1999 and in 2000. Uh, when the board adopted, uh, have one minute left. When the when, it, when the board adopted uh, the the better pension plan, for the more expensive pension plans, I am proud of the fact that El Dorado County we've got a big pension problem. Our problem's not as big as the city of Folsom's or uh, or EIDs or the city of South Lake Tahoe because we have 35 percent cheaper retirement benefits than those jurisdictions, uh, which will save the county hundreds of million dollars over the next 30 years. Uh, uh, the legislature defines who's qualified for this job. My opponent's a CPA, the leg my, so he's qualified. Uh, basically, you have to be a CPA. There's a few other ways you can qualify for the job. I'm a CPA. Uh, on paper, I'm very qualified for the job. Uh, I'm the chairman of the State Controller's Advisory Committee uh, on County Accounting Procedures. That's a committee with uh, three supervisors uh, from around the state. Uh, three CAOs from around the state and four county auditors from around the state and we try to, when the legislature writes a new law or other things happen, we usually end up writing the details procedures for the counties. Thank you, Mr. Wright. So if we have time for uh, two questions as well. Uh, Mr. Harn, I want to quote the 2014-15 grand jury report. <clears throat> it found that you repeatedly failed to comply with legally required reporting requirements. Your malfeasance has cost the county millions of dollars in lost revenue. You have been found to repeatedly engage in bullying and other harassment of county employees. The grand jury recommended that the district attorney investigate you and impanel a criminal grand jury to remove you from office. Why should the voters return you to office for another four years? Uh, the grand jury is basically a group of volunteers, and uh, some some grand juries have loved me, some grand juries haven't like, loved me. In, in terms of bullying, we have a respectful workplace pro, uh, uh, policy at the County of El Dorado. Uh, anyone can, if they feel like they've been bullied or treated disrespectfully, uh, 
they can go to HR and file a, a form 111, and that that would be investigated by an outside investigator. In my career, one Form 111 has been filed against me. The investigator found no evidence of bullying, and actually that employee later retired and sued two other county officers. So that employee was a little bit disgruntled, uh, that in terms of bullying, uh, the bullying issue. Uh, and further, the, the, uh, the survey that was done at the county indicated any department with 10 or more people uh, I had uh, the highest uh, ratings in terms of treating my employees respectfully. Uh, in terms of lost revenue, that's absolutely false. The grand jury got that wrong, and the state controller also wrote a report on that issue, and it found that the county's interim <coughs> IT director failed to keep timesheets uh, that were that are required by the state cost accounting regulations and federal cost accounting reg regulations. Uh, so. If, if the county lost millions of dollars, my question for the grand jury or anybody else, which federal program did we lose the, or state program did we lose these million dollars in? Because I'm unaware of it. I, I frankly, I think I covered the highlights, but I don't remember other issues that were brought up in the question. It was a long question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Address the question. Um, uh, so one of the grand jury reports said in part, Quote, one of the auditor controller employees, after some delay, filed a complaint for harassment with the county credible witnesses reported that this employee excused the delay in filing this complaint by stating that the auditor controller himself insisted that the complaint not be filed until after the election, close quotes. Uh, what part of that is true? What part is not true? What's the disposition of the case and who is the complainant? None of that's true. Now let's 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 go back to the grand jury report. It states I bullied people. It doesn't name one person I bullied or one incident of bullying. Uh, so how can I respond to a grand jury report with no details? Now the grand jury, if they found uh, evidence of half of the of the, the findings they have, or they found evidence to support that, they could have issued an accusation, a grand jury accusation, which has been done in this county before, that, and that would have compelled the district attorney to file a, a motion in court to have me removed from office. So obviously, they didn't find any adequate e evidence to issue an accusation, because frankly, there was no evidence. All right, that's a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. to say thank you to the Democratic Club. I'm very happy to be here in beautiful El Dorado Hills in beautiful El Dorado County on a beautiful spring afternoon. Thanks for hearing me out. I understand why I'm running for auditor controller. My background, well, you heard a little bit of it. I went away, went to school, found myself in Silicon Valley, found myself auditing Apple Computer, found myself auditing Cisco systems when they were tiny, uh, found myself uh, working for a semiconductor company. Uh, in senior finance role as budget uh, budget manager, using IT, really intense IT tools. I uh, found myself uh, doing an IPO, which is the uh, the World Series and the Grand and the uh, Super Bowl all wrapped up into one for accountants. You're not just crunching numbers. You're not just doing taxes. You're working with the government. You're working with the SEC on that. We've also done a system conversion. Uh, we're right now six years and seven and a half million dollars into a kind of complete and kind of incomplete system conversion. That needs some help, it needs some uh, timing that uh, we don't need to spend another seven million dollars to get there. Those are my qualifications. Uh, I left Silicon Valley after I did a worldwide did. I designed and implemented a worldwide revenue audit for Cisco Systems. And then after Sarbanes-Oxley kind of chased the, all the fun out of auditing, I decided to be a winemaker. And so I've been a winemaker up in I am Camino for about 13 years. I love this county. I love farming here. I love making great products. So what can I do differently? What can I add that we're not getting right now? I want to pay vendors on time. I believe that there's 15 to 20 million dollars that's on the table. Why raise taxes if you can get more with what you have? I think we need to uh, 
finalized the Phoenix system implementation, and some of that's getting the MOUs set up. You saw the union and the uh, in the Board of Supervisors chambers on Tuesday. They're frustrated because nobody's coming to the table. Uh, I want to perform work for special districts. Did you know that there's a, you know, the Eldorado Hills CSD spent $100,000 in legal fees trying to get park money out of the county? That's nuts, people. We don't have to act that way. But I want to <clears throat> support, lead, and demand a work environment that respects employees, managers, and vendors. I've worked my entire life in multicultural situations. I've lived in France. I've worked for a Chinese company. I've been in multicultural environments and worked with women my entire life. Never had a problem. Never had any conversations about, Mike, you, uh, you know, you, you, that was inappropriate behavior. I've never seen that. Um, Thank you, Mr. Um, okay. That's our two minute introduction, and we'll have time for two questions. So I'm going to ask you a question that I wasn't able to ask Joe, and, but I'd like your perspective of it. Um, he mentioned that we have quite a bit of expense in road maintenance throughout the county, pensions, that those are two huge budget items that constantly put us in the red. I'd add fire departments into that mix. I'd like to know then as auditor controller how you would feel and address the Board of Supervisors and what advice you would have given them to signing off on a hundred million dollar sheriff's facility that is going to put this county into debt, even with the federal support that might be coming, and how you would have counseled and worked with the Board of Supervisors on something of that magnitude of debt to the taxpayer, given the other issues in the county already. So the, uh, that's a very complex question, um, but I'll, I'll try to do my best with that. Uh, what would I do, faced with the conversation I needed to have with the Board about the Sheriff's facility, and it's about $62 million. Uh, is you know, and you're not and without interest, so maybe you're adding interest in. Well, and without construction issues. Yeah, well, if, if they get it done. Right. <laughs> okay. So the uh, my answer is the uh, sheriff's facilities are pretty in a pretty inefficient set of uh, situations. They're spread out. There's asbestos and leaks in the uh, in the, the building that uh, the main building that the sheriff has. Asbestos means down the down the road you may have really enormous liability because you let people stay and work in there. So what do you do? You can't do nothing. I think doing nothing is wrong. Now, do I love debt? No, I don't love debt, but who has debt on their house? I mean, let's be honest, right? It, debt is part of life uh, in, in, in America. Now, the good news is we didn't go out and, and get a really expensive credit card debt. We found a really pretty cheap program from the federal government that was refer rural counties for our situation. Because you gotta modernize. And we have a situation where Jeep HUD, for instance, didn't modernize and they're spending millions of dollars where they could have spent 100,000. And so you really have to look to the future. Same thing with IT, see now, you gotta look forward and see what's coming down the pipe. Plan for that and invest in it. Thank you, just one follow-up comment. You are aware that they are intending to move the juvenile facility into the old sheriff's building. So I am aware the issues Yeah, and I don't think that's all decided yet. There, there's other conversations out there about uh, using those buildings differently as well. So um, that I can't comment on. Okay. As we uh, get to our next question, just to make a note that all the candidates should likely be around after the forum is ended, and there will be opportunities to engage and ask other questions as well. Uh, Mike. Um, <clears throat> In your campaign handout, you point out that the current auditor controller makes more money than our governor. If elected, would you seek to reduce the auditor's salary and income to a more reasonable level? Well, that's promulgated by the board. Part of the reason that uh, the, the compensation is over $200,000 is uh, not just the base salary, which is about $145,000, and which is not inconsequential, but there are bonuses that are on top of that. The bonuses, one of them is 10% for being a CPA. Well, you have to be a CPA to, to, to get the job, to, to own your job. And um, that, to me, that was put in place to retain employees and to, to attract employees. I, you know, I don't know if it belongs to for elected officials, and if it's taken away from me, I'm not going to cry. When um, I ran last time, they had lowered the, the base salary, and then they raised it again after I didn't win and didn't have the conversation. <laughs> Um, so then uh, the other piece of that is that there's an 18%, I believe, uh, bonus that my opponent gets for being reelected. <laughs> and so if you have a 20-year, longer year history with the county, 
you get uh, a bump. And what that's there for, people, is to retain long-term employees. We don't pay as well as um, Placer County. We don't pay as well as Sacramento County. Well, you heard we have crappier pensions. So you want to retain the people you have, especially the good ones who have that long-term thing. Now, again, does that apply to, ele to elected officials? If it doesn't, it won't break my heart. Um, there's another piece of pay in there that's about 7.8%. I can't quote it. I'm not on the inside, but look at what I can do from the outside. <laughs> um, that you get from management bonus time. And so there, you're, you know, an elected official is being paid for being here tonight. All those things add up for my opponent for about $53,000 a year. And uh, that, that seems like a lot. Um, you know, it's public service, and here's bad news about an economy. If government jobs pay best in an economy, you got a bad economy. And that's what we got, folks. Well, if you ever give a round of applause for Thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be here tonight. I, first thing I'd like to do is introduce my beautiful wife, Teresa. She's uh, out here in the audience. Anyway, I uh, want to thank her for all her support for me running. Um, what I'd like to say about this election uh, is it's not about a choice between liberals, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats. It's about community choice. It's about whether we're going to choose to continue to have our county run by the same clique of people who have brought us the seven years of the Fennec system. You know, it's seven years still unfinished. We have, we have incumbents who've used our office by using it to have lawsuits for publicity, to punish their enemies. We have rampant sexual bullying that's going on in our county. There, there's a countless number of lawsuits. I personally filed a public information request and I was stonewalled by county council saying, no, everything involving uh, harassment lawsuits, the billing for outside attorneys, going back to the gold rush, it's all attorney-client privilege. You can't have it. So anyway, the other choice is to vote in some good reformers. And I think I'm the best choice of reformer running for our recorder clerk's office because I'm a local guy. I grew up in Lotus. I was active in Cub Scouts, school sports. I was a volunteer fireman. I was in 4-H. I went to University of California, Davis. I've got a Bachelor's of Science in Agricultural Economics and Business Management. Following that, I spent nine years working for community nonprofit organizations. I managed the Gilroy Visitors Bureau, the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce, and the Del Norte County Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Authority. That led to working in the state legislature, where I worked with Republicans, Democrats, advancing legislation that helped our county, like saving, swimming, and boating in Slide Park, or, or another that allowed for the electronic recording of documents for county clerks. Another, it made the training for emergency medical technology, or technicians, EMTs, much more volunteer training. So I have that experience. I've worked with both. I also have 18 years of self-employment as a government relations and political consultant. Thank you, Dan. That's excellent. We'll have time for two questions. Well, if you don't have any questions, please come and talk to me after this is over. We have a Thank question you. right up here. Oh. Would you expand on your comment about Stonewall? Yes, um, if you'd like, I can send you the email that I got from County Council. I put in a request specifically asking for all the outside billing records going back for the last uh, decade or so. And I was told by County Council, no, no, it's attorney-client privilege. When I shared with them some appellate court cases that uh, showed that the only thing in dispute was currently pending, so that anything that they viewed anything, even if it was uh, adjudicated, that was attorney client privilege. I'd be happy to share those with you. We have one more question. Yes, so the, the position you're running for is recorder clerk. It has been separated from the elections department. Um, what do you think 
is going to make the difference as recorded? Well, I'm not sure if the, the public here in the county is going to set for having a registrar of voters reporting to the county CAO that's only going to be accountable to perhaps the, the Board of Supervisors. That, that person is not going to have the incentive to rock the boat and go down to the legislature and testify and try to work and get a more sensible uh, amendment to any bad legislation. So, so I don't know if they're going to go for that. Um, I've seen the, the Board of Supervisors reverse itself on different things. I'll go give you an example. Mike Owen alluded to the fact that a whole bunch of us, four years ago, a little over four years ago, we packed the Board of Supervisors and we persuaded the Board of Supervisors to remove the bonuses for elected officials. They kept them for the deserving civil service employees, but they removed them from elected officials. All the incumbents were elected. That issue was off the table, by the way. So everybody thought, things are good. Well, three weeks, about three years ago, three weeks before they were all going to get sworn in, Supervisor Brian Verkamp, the Flashville supervisor, who voted against it the year before, he brought it back, and those bonuses were instituted. Not only that, they made it much easier for our district attorney to collect. They reworded it from the longevity part, what I call the re-election bonus. That was originally only service to El Dorado County. Well, they rewrote it to allow it to be any service, which allowed the district attorney to utilize his years of service to Amador County as a deputy DA. So that's the kind of thing I'm running against. And I'm not going to participate in the bonus scheme. And I'm going to work with all of you who want to help me. And we're going to get rid of this, even if we have to get a charter amendment. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you all for coming tonight. This is a really great crowd, and it's a, it's a blessing to be here. Um, there is one big difference between me and my opponents, and I know what you're thinking. It's that I'm a woman. That's not it. The biggest difference between me and my opponents is I'm the only one that has experience directly related to the office. I am, I've been in the banking and mortgage industry and business finance since 1999. I am currently a mortgage loan officer for Land Home Financial in Cameron Park. So basically, I am dealing with documentation all the time, specifically that is recorded in the recorder clerk's office. I, um, <clears throat> I, um, um, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so, um, basically, this is what it's all about. It's about a job, and I'm here because of my experience. I'm here to give back to the community that I love so much, that my husband and I live here um, with our four kids. Basically, um, going back to my business is that um, currently I'm the affiliate director for the El Dorado County Association of Realtors. I work with realtors all the time, and meeting with affiliates, uh, I, I direct them, I lead them on any uh, changes that need to be made, any issues that need to be taken care of, so I have the experience of dealing with people. Um, and also with the El Dorado County Association of Realtors, I volunteer a lot of my time in giving back to our community. I'm, I was the uh, chairman of the golf tournament, which we were able to raise over $25,000 for three local charities in our community. Um, I, I'm also a very active member of the, of the Rotary Club in Cameron Park. And uh, basically, again, I'm just here to tell you that I'm here to serve our community, and, um, and it's all about public service and not politics. Thank you very much. Can you tell, expand on the, um, the qualifications? I, I, Saying your opponents are, are uh, for better or less of a better word, the career politicians, if you will. 
And you, as the custodian of vital statistics, given your background, can you expand on, on how that will benefit the community, rather than hearing about who's going to do what, and sue who, and so forth? Just go back right to the job and explain how you're going to handle it. Sure. So, um, just to break it down for you really quick, uh, the job is basically you have two sides of the office. You have the recorder side and you have the clerk side. The recorder side is basically is all of your real estate documents um, of real property. It's all recorded there, your deeds, your liens, your easements, your maps, all of that documentation is there recorded in the recorder clerk's office. Then on the clerk side, what you have is all the vital statistics, like you said, is your birth certificates, your death certificates, marriage licenses, fictitious business name statements. Um, basically, it's all about paperwork. It's all an administrative office. And so making sure dealing with, I work deal with paperwork and administration in my daily job. And basically, um, ba I want to build a team and a community so that we can be there to serve the public. If anybody ever has a question, you know, why can't I record this document? Well, maybe it's because you have to record another docu document before that. And that's where it comes with the real, uh, the real estate uh, um, experience is that, you know, sometimes you need um, a deed report, deed of trust, that type of thing. And I can be able to, I can explain uh, the difference between those documents to the public. Yes. Following a Bill Schultz's footsteps is going to be a tough task. He's done a great job. What do you anticipate uh, as changes you'll make to move us forward into the future? Yeah, Bill has done a really tremendous job on, on updating uh, electronic recording and that type of thing. As technology changes consistently, uh, I would like, um, right now you do not have the ability to be able to go into the office and re or you do have the ability, the only way you can get a copy is going into the office and obtaining that copy. Um, it would, a lot of other counties have the ability of being able to obtain those copies right at your desktop so you don't have to go down to the office. I think that that is the, where we're going in, in the future and I think that as being a service provider, I think that that would be uh, good to the community. Also, um, there, I want to develop a cross training within the office. Um, for example, in South Lake Tahoe, we have one full-time employee, one part-time employee. Um, a lot of times, that full-time employee still has to come to work because uh, even though she's sick, because there isn't anybody to replace her or so or anybody to come down from Placerville. Nobody wants to go to South Lake Tahoe um, to fill that position. So being able to cross-train somebody so that they can go down there and help, uh, I think that would be really great. Also. Todd White, and I'm glad this is on tape because I was talking to Mrs. Boylan before this started. This is probably the only time I will thank the Albany County Democrat Party for allowing me to come down here and speak to this evening. So a little bit about myself. I uh, currently serve on the Elroy Union High School District. I've done so since 2010. So we have 6,600 students that range from this high school here all the way up to Elroy High School. Uh, in the east. So, uh, a little bit about myself. I work for Big Brothers Big Sisters, Belvoir County, and we oversee over 200 matches between positive adult role models and at-risk youth. I currently mentor uh, a three-year-old uh, in South Lake Tahoe and a six-year-old. We've been matched for one year, well, for four months with the youngest one, and three years with the oldest one. So, I, I work with seven people at Big Brothers Big Sisters, have a great time. Uh, being involved with the Chambers of Commerce, Melbourne Hills to South Lake Tahoe. I currently serve as an ambassador for the Tahoe Chamber for the last three years. Uh, something about me that probably differentiates myself from the other candidates is, although I may not agree with everybody as, as politically, and there's three Republicans, there's no Democratic candidates running for recorder clerk, 
is the work in the community that I've done, it's about community, and it's about the 4-H clubs, it's about the, the, the youth activities and everything in between. And I think that my actions have demonstrated that I care for the community. Uh, we work really hard on the Albany and High School District Board. Uh, we have a $65 million budget, 300 staff members. We just hired a new superintendent and uh, some educational background. I hold a master's in management and leadership and a bachelor's and an associate's degree in uh, social sciences. And so that's a little bit about me. I'd be happy to take your questions and thank you so much for your time. <coughs> For the last couple of months, there have been reports going around the buzz about uh, a, an allegation that you worked for the county at one time, were terminated your services, and Rodney Stano, who had worked with you in one campaign, uh, gave the reason that you said he provided, that you provided. So you haven't commented. Could you tell us what parts of that is true, what part isn't true, and can you just give it us an explanation? Yeah, thank you. Why you have question. my children? Thank you for the question. So I ran for office now. This is my fourth time. I ran for office in 2006 for the high school board, and I didn't win that election. I won by nine votes in 2010. and got reelected by 5,000 votes in 2014. Throughout the campaign, I've never had an easy campaign. They've always been rough, and there's always much slung back and forth. So that's the way it goes, and those. Those statements, that trash, is exactly what it is. It's baseless and has no relevance to this campaign. When I campaign, I don't talk about my opponents or trash my opponents. I talk about my qualifications and what I can bring to the table. Thank you. And if you do, are you going to do something about another high school in this district? I didn't get the last part of the question. And if you do run for board, are you going to do anything about a school, uh, another high school in this end of the county? In, in the other one, Hills area? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the first part of your question is, uh, will I run for the school board again if I'm elected recorder mm -hmm. clerk? So school boards don't have a... A primary. So we'll see how the June primary goes. Um, it's been a pretty exhausting campaign, so I would probably, you know, just run for recorder. Um, but we'll see. We'll kind of confront it as it comes. If I don't make it through the primary, then I guess I'm running for the high school board again. As far as the second part of your question, uh, you know, that is such a a good question for this community because. Uh, going back, a large portion of this community pays Melrose taxes, and so and those funds were designated to stay within the community, which is Alvarez Hills. So we have 2,456 students at this high school. At Union in mind, we have a little over a thousand. So you can see the majority of the students are in the western slope of the county, and we can't expect people to. Uh, I mean, we could fill those schools, we could redraw boundary lines, and we could fill those schools, but I don't think that's fair to expect somebody, if you live within the community, you should be able to go to your neighborhood school. The high school district owns 200 acres in the business park, and we've got funding coming through to the Melrose bonds and other sources, and we need to figure out something so that this community can continue to be served by the local high school. What we've done is we've allowed, we did do some minor adjustments to boundaries that allow uh, parts of Serrano and Lake Hills to attend Oak Ridge, and we also allow Blackstone to attend uh, Ponderosa. So we're, we're working on it. It's an, it's an issue because the enrollment is so much greater than it is up the hill. So, thank you for the round of applause for Tom White. Next up, we have the Treasurer, Tax Collector, and Billings. She uh, makes her way up. I'd just like to highlight again, you know, the importance of cross collaboration between Republicans and Democrats. Love that we have Republicans here and also Democrats. You know, politics is all about facilitating conversation. And I'm really glad that we're able to have a conversation here tonight about issues that impact our community. Thank you. It's not 
not the most fun position to run for because most people don't want to pay their taxes. Can't hear you. We don't like them. Anyway, I, I decided to run for this position when Sadly, Seal Rafferty, after more than 30 years of dedicated public service, chose not to file papers and run for office. My work in the county has uh, centered in two pivotal departments related to this position, the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office and the Auditor Controller's Office. I've worked for the county for 15 years, five years in the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office and 10 years in the Auditor Controller's Office, where I currently work in the um, uh, reporting unit. In the treasurer's office, I was responsible for the reporting, the banking, the daily cash flow analysis, and the accounting of the county's $500 million fixed income portfolio. I was also, um, I understand the government codes and the regulations related to these types of investments. And I also conducted formal tax hearings, and um, I did tax compliance audits, and as well as um, conducting Treasury internal control audits and Treasury transaction audits for fraud detection and prevention. My experience has touched many levels in accounting and I have uh, done banking, auditing, internal control, uh, fixed income investments. I've lived in the county for 17 years. I've had my kids have been raised in this community and have graduated from Ponderosa High School. I believe I'm the best candidate for this position because the other candidate, while very fine, has uh, most of their county experience in uh, federal and state mandated social services programs and has uh, worked for the Treasure Tax Collector's Office for less than a year. Elected to this office, I would continue to offer a high level of customer service. I think customer service is hugely important to this office. People will call this office wanting information about their business licenses or about a tax clearance. They'll have it, um, they may need to set up a payment plan. Well, whatever the reason they're calling, they need and deserve a high level of customer service to get the information and um, the answers that they need. Does that mean I have to yes. stop? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have time for two questions in the office. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, as the tax collector, you work with the auditor controller and the assessor in the administration of property taxes. Yes. The county is implementing a new property tax system which is going live on July 1st. How do you see the tax collector's office moving forward and adopting to the changes that will be coming with the new property system and your role in working with the other two elected officers to properly administer the property tax administration program? Well, everybody, in any new implementation, as we all know, everybody's like babies trying to figure out how the screens work. And so, you know, training is clearly an issue with any new system. Even as we went live with Phoenix, it was a big issue. And uh, I think good communication between departments is really important to make sure there's good rapport within the departments with staff communication. But there's problems, you know. Um, getting the information. I know that the tax collector's office gets a lot of uh, questions about what's, wh why is their bill so high and sometimes that communication has to get put back to the assessor's office or sometimes the auditor's office needs that information because, you know, for whatever <coughs> reason. So, um, I think uh, it's a broad question uh, to, to deal with. It's a big deal that going, we're going on megabyte and it's uh, going to be a good transition, I think. I'm, Positive or transition. Thank you. Have one more question? I got a question. Mike with the mic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Saunders, part of the Colorado Central Committee, the Democratic side. Uh, my question is what is your position on sell offs for delinquent accounts to collection agencies? I um, would not think it was beneficial if I was looking for the best interest in the fiduciary duty to the county, I would not think it was beneficial for the county to sell them off at a discount. Great. Round of applause. So next up, uh, we'll have a series of three uh, for the Board of Supervisors, District 4. First will be the candidate Bo M. Rosowitz.
So hopefully I won't have an attack like I just did a while ago. How you folks doing? How many of you own homes? Raise your hand. All right. So uh, I'm an architectural designer and a builder. I've done that for over 40 years. Uh, I've lived in the county about 15 years. I've lived in Placer County since the early 70s. Um, I know our county inside and out. I ran for governor four years ago. Uh, I've studied the water situation. I've studied the employment situation. I've studied the sanctuary state situation. Uh, but being self-employed as a designer and a builder of um, custom homes and also uh, small commercial projects. So I understand the laws, rules, regulations, ADA codes. But the biggest thing that we have right now as far as like home ownership is concerned is it's not affordable anymore. Um, our permits are way too expensive. Uh, when I built my first home in the 1870s, oh no, 1970s, I uh, spent $600 on my building permit, okay? Now that same building permit today could be anywhere from forty dollars to $60,000. So um, it's not affordable anymore. Also, uh, I would propose to cut that 50% off, okay? And the reason we can do that, because uh, we have a general plan, which has been revised less than a year ago, basically. Um, but things are still outrageous. Uh, I'm currently building a house right now in Greenwood. That's where I live. And there's no real transparency when you go to the building department to get the information that you need. It's very hard to get. You have to get run around from different departments. Um, so what I would uh, suggest, in uh, most government agency is to um, have private uh, partnerships. Um, that's been done before and works really well. Uh, also, the buildings that we build for the county, um, they should be just average, basic buildings. No Taj Mahals. That belongs in our homes. Um, so that's one major change. Uh, the other thing that I differ with my uh, opponents is that I'm the only person that's not raising any money to run for office. I think that's very important. I'm not going to be bought and paid for, and I'm going to, not going to sell us, the voters, out. Um, Thank you, Bo. We'll have time for two questions. Sorry, the light came up. We have a uh, one from the back. Hi. Uh, four years ago, we met in the parking lot of the White Town Center, and you approached me. And I think at the time, you said that you did live over in Placer. So my question is, how long have you been registered to vote in this county, Eldorado County? Because I'm a little bit confused. Okay, um, I have 74 acres in um, Greenwood, which I bought about 15 years ago. Um, I divided the property, it was a nightmare. Um, cost a lot of money. Um, I lived there for about 10 years, sold my house, then I moved away for two years, uh, down Fair Oaks with my brother. So, you know, off and on, I've been here around 15 years, I've had property, and uh, I've been in Placer in Eldorado County since the 70s. First time I went to uh, Desolation Road Nest was 1966. Um, but I asked how long have you been registered to vote in Eldorado County? That's all I was wanting to know. Well, I've been registered off and on, so uh, it's not that when I... When were you last registered to vote, starting here? I'm currently registered to vote in Eldorado County now. So four years ago, were you registered in Eldorado County? That's what I'm just trying to figure it out. Four years ago when I ran for governor, I was in uh, Placer County. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> There's no real issue there. I'm, like I say, I know the county inside and out from uh, being an ultra marathoner. I've run 100 mile endurance runs. Uh, and I've also built from and you're from Tahoe to uh, San Francisco, so we have a lot of bureaucracies, and we don't need no, no more bureaucracies. We need to downsize our government. Uh, any other questions? Another question? Yes, sir. There was a recent development in there was a recent development in El Dorado Hills for some apartments. Uh, how would how would you? address uh, the uh, issue of the changes that were had that were re required for the uh, from the uh, general plan for a, a development like that are you talking about the town center yep okay um, 
I wouldn't have come to a project there. Uh, I thought it was quite quaint and, uh, you know, still had a general feeling that people move up here for. I'm not a big developer. I don't promote big de development. I only build custom things and people's dreams homes or dream businesses. Uh, so I would not be for that kind of development. Um, I'm more a cross between um, a holistic person. I've also written a book. It's called Reach Life's Peak. I work with a lot of people that are, have mental disabilities, and uh, that's where the proceeds go for the book that I sell here. Um, I have lots of people, in, even in our family, that have had you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I've raised five, uh, money for both of those organizations. Uh, so um, I know our community, and I believe uh, in organic food and sustainable agriculture and things like that. So uh, I'm not sure rip-off artist, uh, big developer type, uh, could never go for that. We can give a round of applause for both. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here this evening. I'm Lori Parlin. I'm running for Supervisor of Eldorado County, District 4. Um, I grew up in Camino and Pollock Pines, raised my family in Shingle Springs, and that, because of that I feel very connected to our county, and like most of you, I consider Eldorado County my home. Um, that sense of place where we like to be after work, with our friends, with our families, our homes. And I feel very protective of our county because it is our home. And uh, our Board of Supervisors has been making decisions lately that's been causing a lot of angst um, in our communities. And um, for example, those town center apartments. There were campaign promises made. I like to carry around these campaign promises by some supervisors um, for no land use changes. And that town center apartment, sure enough, needed a big land use change. It swapped some of our commercial, which commercial land in the county, we were told was very scarce. And yet the supervisors voted to switch it over to high density apartments in an area that is highly congested with traffic. Um, I was approached, I've become an, a community advocate over the last several years in the county, um, and I was one of the people that joined the group to try and stop that switch of land use. Um, that, that is where the big angst is in our county, that our Board of Supervisors often don't appear to be listening to the communities, and um, that's something that I really do do. <laughs> Um, is when a community is having an issue with a decision by the supervisors, uh, I'll be approached, I, I join with that community, try to help them through the process to maybe overturn or overcome some of those decisions by the board that are causing us. Is the red one to stop? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We'll have time for two questions. <coughs> Bo mentioned sanctuary cities. I know this is a really hot button. What's your take? Did you have to go there? <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting, the county just put out a press release, I think it was yesterday. Um, it was by the CAO and um, county council. And um, I had stated at the State of Jefferson candidate forum that if our sheriff approached the Board of Supervisors, and I do supervisor, if the sheriff said, I need a resolution to keep our community, our county safe, I would support that. Um, I don't think that, uh, this is a very serious issue that should not be used um, as a political wedge between people and parties. Um, it should be about public health and safety. So I'm sticking to that statement. Time for another question. Rich? Rich. Rich. Rich, Rich. I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you wait for a microphone? Yes. Good choice. Um, okay. Your campaign site says you're running to protect our 
economy from those threatening our quality of life with urbanization and higher taxes. Yes. How will you, as supervisor, resist the big developers' historical control on the Board of Supervisors? Well, um, historically, in my short time <laughs> of advocating for communities in the county, the developers don't like me. Um, I work with the communities and the residents. Um, the, and that's usually, unfortunately, against the big developers. I, I like our local contractors, you know, that want to build the single homes like Bo was talking about. That's, that's a local economy that puts our local contractors to work. It's the big developments that don't fit within our communities. They don't fit the sense of place. Changing our general plan on any given Tuesday. I don't know how many of you know that phrase, but um, the Board of Supervisors typically meets on Tuesdays. And so all you need is three votes and you can change things. And um, environmental law, CEQA, uh, we thought that that would be our way to protect our communities, but it turns out the Board of Supervisors can vote to use what's called overriding considerations and change plans anyway. Uh, and again, that's where our angst is. When the supervisors, they override those plans, you buy your house, you think you know what's gonna happen in your neighborhood, and then on a Tuesday, three out of five of them vote and change your neighborhood. Not okay. Thank you, Lord. Next up tonight, we have Michael Rinaldi, our incumbent candidate for Board of Supervisors this quarter. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank um, the committee for organizing this event tonight. I want to thank the Oak Ridge High School for providing the great venue. And most importantly, I want to thank you for taking a Friday evening after a beautiful day uh, to come out here for this important event. And we deeply appreciate it. I think all the candidates would, would concur with that. Uh, thank you for taking your time. So yes, I am Michael Rinaldi, your County District 4 Supervisor, uh, Chair of the El Dorado County Board of Supervisors. I'm the uh, chair of our county's transportation commission, and I'm vice chair of our water agency. Um, you know, I failed to mention my wife of 24 years who has stood beside me in this uh, journey, and I so appreciate her support, not just tonight, but throughout this process. I'm very proud of her. Um, okay, so I have been an El Dorado County citizen for 34 years, all in the district that I serve. I love this county like many of you. I came here for and stay here for many of the same reasons that everyone else does. We love this place. And yeah, we have a lot of fights between us and a lot of disagreements, but I really do, do believe it's because at our core, we all ve feel very deeply for this county and we fight hard for it. But we must do that with civility and and sensitivity to each other. And I've done that throughout my career, and I've done that as a sitting supervisor. Um, you can go on websites and find out what some of us stand for. You can see uh, some of our actions at the Board of Supervisors to know what we stand for. You know, we need, we need jobs, we need housing for people who, who, who live here, and jobs for people who work here. I mean, we cannot sustain our economy if we are not able to occupy our business parks with advanced manufacturing. And to do that, we need moderately priced housing. If this county wants to remain rural, and we're going to be agriculture, recreation, and tourism, where do those people live? So when it comes to this issue of development, this is not about large subdivisions and large developers controlling our interests. If we're going to support this economy, if we're going to stay rural, this county has to start finding ways to provide housing that's affordable for people who work here. If you're in agriculture, recreation, and tourism, you're not living in a multi-million dollar home. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Renaud. We'll have time for two questions. My name is Charles Nunn. I live in Ridgeview and have lived in El Dorado County for 35 plus years. And my question, you know, I don't disagree with your statements about what we need in the county. 
However, an individual I talked to that just bought a lot in the Ridgeview area, and this has been a couple of years ago now, and in a conversation with him, I learned that he is going to spend $80,000 for fees to the county before he even lays his foundation. My question is, how can the county expect affordable housing when they're charging fees like that to anyone who develops? And this is a single house. I don't have any idea what Serrano pays or someone like that. But I'm saying if an individual comes up here and buys a lot to build a house, how do you expect it to grow when you uh, load fees onto a prospective homeowner like that? Thank you for the question. I think the simple answer is at, at that fee skip, at that fee level, you can't do it. Certainly not a moderately priced well, house. Excuse me. And, 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 and the utilities were all there in the street. It was not like you had to bring them 200 yards yeah. back to his house. Yeah, you can't. You, on the street. you can't do that with a fee structure that way. You know, our how county. Do you, how do you change? That? Okay, so our county has eight what's called um, 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 mitigation fee zones. Eight of them, and each one of them has a slightly different fee structure. Many of those fee structures are a result of its pro the, 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 the market zone's proximity to Highway 50 and the costs that are, that are assessed in order to maintain the level of service on Highway 50. Just recently, over the last two years, as part of, as part of my efforts on the Board of Supervisors, as you move further, further north in the county or further south in the county, those fees have come down because you can't do that. You can't have that fee. In the areas along the Highway 50 corridor, where this county has already invested in infrastructure, water, and sewer, those fees are high. They're very likely going to remain high. But there are places in this county, in fact, our general plan, its very purpose, in fact, state law says, make housing affordable to all levels of income. We're not doing that. We're, we've been building McMansions and we've got fee structures that prohibit property owners from actually being able to exercise their property rights. So we've begun the process of right-sizing that. And we've done that, for example, in the North County, where the, where the traffic impact mitigation fees have been reduced by 70%, and 68%. That's a pretty significant drop. Now, I'm not sure exactly that location, and I'm not sure what, what uh, 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 TAS traffic uh, zone you're in, um, but I'm guessing its proximity to Highway 50 and the cost of keeping the level of service on Highway 50 has resulted in that. But there are places in this county where we can do that. And we've begun to do that. In fact, we've made some other changes that are very, very critical to housing that's affordable for folks. It has been this county's policy to, to charge a TIM fee on what's called a granny flat, a second dwelling unit. Second dwelling unit in 2002 was decided by the state legislature to be considered affordable housing. And the counties get an allocation for affordable housing. Why in the world wouldn't we use that, that allocation for affordable housing on a granny flat? Okay, so that was what the action was that I led by our board of supervisors, and we got that passed with a 4-1 vote. Okay, so if you're in a rural county, and you're looking for a, an affordable rural living condition, why in the world wouldn't you consider on an existing parcel a granny flat that allows not only for mom and pop to live on the property with their kids, but multi-generational family, students, elderly. This has been really imp an important move in your county, and it's not well known. Uh, we've you. increased the size of the granny flat. Right. Yeah. One more yeah. question. question. Yes. Yes. So continuing on that then, Mike, granny flats are not going to solve the affordable housing problem in this county. Let's be realistic about that. Um, the town center apartment complex that was recently mentioned? Yes. Is that affordable housing? No. So why did the Board of Supervisors approve that? Okay, so in town center, you're not going to be able to deliver affordable housing in town center. So and I want to rebut for one second what you're saying, just so that you're aware. I happen to be aware, as you know, I'm a school board member for West mm -hmm. Union School District. We run a summer feeding program in town center in an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. 
Town Center, Eldorado Hills, needs affordable housing just as much as other areas in this county. So this misperception that only wealthy people are going to need to move into and buy homes and live in Eldorado Hills is not correct. It is a huge summer feeding program. I'd invite you to come and take a look at the number of people to take advantage of that. Yeah. At some point, one other question to tag on to that. So why we would approve how apartments that are not affordable, and also by changing those TIM fees, we've seen our roads, those of us who live in rural areas like Rescue, who used to have asphalt roads, now have been degraded to G DG roads among our main roads, and we pay substantially high permit fees as well. So First of all, TIM fees can't be used on road maintenance. They're, they're collected for a different purpose. And as for the town center, um, I don't disagree that there's not opportunities in El Dorado Hills for affordable housing. In fact, we need them everywhere. I'm saying the particular lot that was, so, that was pursued by an applicant for the apartment complex was not likely a viable spot for affordable housing. That was my, that was my remark. And as for the price points for those apartments, while the economy changes, before making that decision and participating in that decision, I met with executives from uh, Blue Shield. Okay, Blue Shield, one of the one of the biggest employers in El Dorado Hills. I had an audience with not only their IT director but two of their HR directors for the for the site and for their call center. And my question to them is. At the anticipated price point for those apartments, could your employees afford them? And here's the answer I got. The, the, the answer from the IT director was somewhat predictable. They get a high, higher paid salary. They tend to be movers location-wise, and they're not ready to buy and, 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 and have a foundation and live in one spot. They want flexibility in their job. It was clearly in their price point, and it was three minutes from their location five minutes from the rest of, of, of El Dorado Hills um, 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 uh, business park. The surprise question came from the HR director for the call center. We're talking about employees at a much, much lower price. Here's what she told me. She said, that business is in a cluster with um, uh, Covered California and a handful of other like medical facilities that have call centers. They can't afford housing. Most of those employees live in Sacramento or West Sacramento. Or Garden and they, Valley. And they, tra and they travel very, very far for their job. She said when you add the travel cost and the time away from their family, those price points are affordable for those employees. Now, I'm not talking about affordable housing like low and very low income. I'm talking about those that can support the middle class. And their answer, not mine, those exe executives told me they thought that was very helpful. It was three minutes from their building. Now remember, we're trying to attract jobs to the business park. If we don't provide housing affordable to all levels, like state law says, and again, I'm not talking about that specific location, we will not be able to fulfill that job's goal. And so I do agree with you. I'm suggesting that that site may across some sellings. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that Thank we you, would Mr. have ever had that proposal. That'll Thank be you. it for all of us. So, to conclude tonight, we'll have a minute for each candidate. Lori will, will uh, present the mic to each of you down here, and you'll have a minute to conclude your remarks. We're going to start where everybody started talking. So, Trish, you have one minute, otherwise I yank it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my one minute. I would like to say that I have been a deputy district attorney here for 21 years. I have done the most challenging cases in the office. I am committed to this office. I love this office. I love the people that I work with. We do a great job for you, for you in our community, but we are lacking in the leadership, the integrity of leadership that we need to do the best job possible for you. And I would ask for your support in June, June 5th. Don't forget to vote. I would be the 34th district attorney in El Dorado County that started in 1850 and the first female. Thank you. This is a woman's year. And, and to note, Joe Harn has left, so he doesn't have his mitt. He's left the building.
So I'm Mike Owen, and I uh, spoke to you a little bit earlier, but I wanted to tell you it's really important for me to run to run this race and run it clean, run it well. And I'm keeping my energy up. I've done all the pounded all the signs in. I'm going to bring that same energy to the office. We have the same person in 24 years. It's a long time. It was before the internet. I'm going to modernize it. I'm going to bring it up to speed. I can find money. One of the things that we might be missing is where's the money? Where's the? I'm a numbers guy. I can find money because I don't want to raise taxes. So I think that and a host of other reasons would be great reasons to vote for me on June 5th. Thank you. Yeah. And Dellinger. I just want to thank all of you for taking your civic duty seriously, coming out here on a Friday night to listen to us. And I urge any of you, please call me. I've got some literature out there. My, my phone number is 530-644-5683. Please call me if you've got any good uh, problem-solving ideas. And I will meet with anyone, any group, regardless of whether it costs me votes or not, on whether they have some good ideas to help improve our county. And I want to thank you and urge you to get all your neighbors out on June 5th. Thank you, everybody, again, for coming. Um, just basically, I'm not a polished politician. I'm a person just like you. Um, basically, I come with the experience, and I'm here to serve and do the very best and bring my, my expertise on the documents and, and so that we can make it better and improve and so that we can serve Eldorado County. Um, so I, I ask for your vote on June 5th, Janelle Horn for Recorder Clerk. Chair of the Democratic Party and the Chair of the Republican Party. Todd White, running for recorder clerk. Uh, eight years ago, you entrusted a 23 year old young kid to run for the high school board, and I've had the honor and the privilege of doing that. Born and raised here in Alberta County, and then have had an awesome time serving the entire community. And I think I have the education, uh, the involvement, and the knowledge uh, of the county to do a good job, and I will work my heart out for you. Thank you for your time. Did a tremendous job as our treasure tax collector, and I will do my best to maintain that same level of excellence in office. Mm -hmm. And I will, as well as um, keeping and the safety of the county cool, and I will honor and be um, a fair and honest and uh, transparent in office. And thank you so much for everybody coming out on a Friday night and listening to this. Coleman, because of a family emergency, could not be here, but the Democratic Party is supporting her. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Joe. <laughs> oh, no, it's Bo. Sorry. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you very much for coming out, and uh, it's really a great, we appreciate it that uh, people do take the time. Uh, having run for different offices, um, I find that uh, too many people are uninformed and they don't participate. It's very sad. But um, because I've been self-employed for 40 years as a designer and a builder, I want to stress that that's really important um, as far as my qualifications are concerned. Uh, because I'm about bringing people together. I don't care what party you're with. You know, I always have to bring projects in on time, on budget and um, make sure that I know what I'm doing, uh, and that's what, that's what I've done. Uh, also, 15% uh, cut for the supervisors, and 15% cut for the department heads, and a 5% cut for the budget of $500 million for El Dorado County. Thank you very much. promises. I carry him around with me. And he has a voting record. And I would say that a lot of his promises were not kept. And that has caused a lot of mistrust in our county and a lot of angst. And so I have been working the last, I don't know, six or seven years out with the communities. 
and trying to get their voices heard. And as supervisor, I will continue to do that. I will listen to the communities. I will take action on behalf of the communities, not for the big developer. And so um, I really hope to have your support on that. And thank you again for coming out tonight. OK, I'm Michael Rinelli, um, your current supervisor. And I am seeking a second term. Um, I'm here to respectfully ask you for your vote. Um, you know, the job of county supervisor is very, very difficult. When you're a candidate, um, it, a, a lot of things can be said. When you're a sitting supervisor and you swear to follow the Constitution, the Constitution of the state, and, and our local laws, you find yourself very conflicted in some very, very difficult and unpopular decisions. I'm very proud of my track record. I'm conflicted by many of the decisions that I've made, but I am proud to have represented the district for this period, and I hope and expect um, to have your support, and I really encourage you to engage me if you have questions. Um, I'll stay here tonight as long as necessary. Um, I will be available and have been available to my constituents moving forward. And so again, June 5th, I'm respectfully asking you for your vote. Thank you very much. Register, vote, and volunteer.